his flow praise him all creatures
That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. The Spirit's telling me we should just keep singing that right there. That there's some of you out there that need to declare that. That our Father is a good Father. And the fact of the matter is that we are loved. We're loved by Him, and that's who we are. We're His children, amen? Let's just declare this out. You're a good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. We praise you because, Lord, you're worthy more than anything. First and foremost, you are worthy, God. And then you're gracious enough to send your son. God, you did all the work. You did all the hard work. And you just call us to yourself. So, Lord, right now, we can't even help but just pour out. just a, an offering of thanks tonight. God, you're so good.
lift up our hands tonight. This is a sign of surrender. As we sing this out, let's just let this be our prayer. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Tonight, because we have three really, really powerful psalms, um, and I just really want to pray that the Lord would do what He wants to do here tonight. So let's just all go before Him. Father, what a sweet time of worship. Very, very powerful songs talking about who You are, and that's a big theme in Psalm 113. Lord, we, we don't worship You based on circumstances. We worship You based on who You are, and we'll We'll learn more about who you are tonight. Lord, we want to pray for the team coming back from Guatemala. Thank you for the opportunities and the fruit that's going to be born from this trip. And we pray, Lord, that this trip will have been an investment in future ministry that many of us can participate in. Lord, just your will be done. And we pray for the team as they're driving back here tonight. Lord, be with them. Keep them safe. Whoever's driving, Lord, probably Tony, keep him alert. And I pray, Lord, that they would get home safely and, Lord, that we could hear about this trip on Sunday. Lord, we want to pray over the evening. It's so easy for us to walk in here and just kind of follow our structure. But, Lord, we, we want to yield this entire evening and everything that happens, every one of our hearts, we want to yield to the Holy Spirit. And we want to ask you would work in our lives tonight, Lord, in a very powerful way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 113 through 118 
are called the Egyptian Hallel Psalms. Now there's three different groupings of Psalms within the larger volume of the book of Psalms that are called Hallel Psalms. And I want to just kind of tell you what the word Hallel means. It means praise. And so when we say Hallelujah, we are saying praise Yahweh. And a lot of people, that's like, they go, I never knew that. It's like total revelation. So when, when you hear that word Hallel, it's the word praise. When you say Hallelujah, you're specifically praising Yahweh, the God of the universe. And so three different places in the book of Psalms, we have what are called the Hallel Psalms. And what you have is a grouping of psalms of praise that were written to the Lord because of a very specific reason. The Egyptian Hallel Psalms were sung at the traditional Passover meal that we call a Seder. If you've ever been to a Passover Seder, we've had a number of them here over the years. It's really a living out of the Exodus story. And so when the Hebrew people would get together and they would celebrate the Passover, they would have a Passover meal. It, in time, it began to be called a Seder. It's S-E-D-E-R, Seder. And it's just the traditional Passover meal. And what they would do is they would sing Psalms 113 and 114 before the meal, and then 115 through 118 after the meal. But as we study tonight and next week, I want you to keep in mind what the Passover is all about. So I'm going to take a minute and just remind you of the Passover. After, what was it, 430 years of being slaves and being in bondage to Pharaoh and to Egypt, the Lord remembered the cries of his people. And so he began this process of delivering them. And the deliverance didn't take place overnight. You know, it came with nine plagues that attacked nine specific deities that the Egyptian people worshipped at the time. And then, when Pharaoh continually hardened his heart, continually said things like, who is the Lord that I should let his people go, anything like that, finally God says, I'm going to send one final plague and it's going to be that plague that sets my people free. And we know what happened is the Lord spoke to Moses. Moses was supposed to go to the men and say, every man is to go and to take a lamb. And he's to bring it into his home. And it was to be brought into the home on a specific day. It was supposed to stay there for a certain amount of days. And then at a specific time, the lamb was to be sacrificed. Its blood was to be caught in a, a bowl. The body was supposed to be prepared a certain way and then eaten. But that blood taken in the bowl, they would take hyssop and they would dip it in and they would touch the, the doorposts and they would touch the lentil. And if you were to connect those lines, obviously you got the picture of a cross, right? And so what happened is that the blood of the lamb was put over the house of everybody who had put their faith in the fact that God was going to save them. The blood of the lamb saved them. And so that night, the death angel comes through Egypt, wipes out the firstborn of everything. And that was how the Israelites were delivered. And they left, and then their journey began. And they went out into the wilderness, and, you know, they, they had to cross the Red Sea. And then they went to Mount Sinai. They got the law. And then they disobeyed God's word. And so for 40 years, they wandered through the desert until that generation died. And at the end of 40 years, their children, with just Joshua and Caleb from that first generation, crossed over the Jordan. And they went into the promised land. And that was a picture of, of them coming into what you and I might call sanctification, or we call it spiritual victory. And so you have to keep all this in mind tonight and next week as we study these Egyptian Hallel Psalms so that they'll make sense. And so we'll begin at Psalm 113. And this is a really, really powerful psalm. And uh, we're going to take it line by line. We're going to begin 
and I'll give you the title. We're going to call this The Cry of the Redeemed. Now remember, everything we talk about this week and next Wednesday night, it revolves around Passover. These psalms for generations were sung during the Passover meal. And so you got to remember that this all has to do with Passover. So Psalm 113, we're calling this the cry of the redeemed. And it's super refreshing. I'll tell you why this psalm is so refreshing. This psalm is pure praise. A as you read it from the beginning of the psalm to the end, there's nothing but praise. Notice the beginning. It just says, praise the Lord. Guess what that word is? Hallelujah. Okay, so it's the beginning of the Hallel Psalms. It starts with the Hallel. Hallelujah. And what you're going to see in this psalm is that it's just pure praise. The psalmist that wrote this doesn't at any time petition the Lord. He doesn't request the Lord. He doesn't cry out to the Lord. He doesn't complain to the Lord. All he does is praise the Lord. And it reminds us that at the Passover, the heart, the mode, Everything was just about praise. We're remembering that God brought us out of Egypt and into the promised land. And for you and I, when we approach the Lord, we need to remember that we were brought out of sin and bondage and we were brought into freedom because of Christ. And so notice this. The author is going to tell us who should praise the Lord, why God should be praised, when we should praise him, just all sorts of stuff. No, notice, this is who should praise the Lord. Reading here still in verse 1, he says, Praise, O servants of the Lord. Now here's something to ponder. I, I just never really thought about this before. Or maybe I have. Maybe I've talked about this, but it seems fresh to me. It's kind of interesting. If God is going to be praised, he is going to be praised by the redeemed. In other words, if you look back to Israel coming out of Egypt, and there they are, you know, walking across the desert. They don't even know the Red Sea is ahead of them. They don't know Pharaoh's going to chase them. All they're doing is they're just, they're praising God, right? We have been delivered, and we're rich. <laughs> Remember that? They took all the goods. They plundered Egypt, and they're leaving. They're praising the Lord. Only the redeemed of the Lord were praising him. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you think that there were Egyptians praising God that day? How about Canaanites? Were there Canaanites that had heard that, that you know, the, the Israelites had been set free and that they were going to come and take their land? Was anybody in Canaan praising Yahweh that day? I want you to think about this. Is there anybody praising God today who hasn't been redeemed by the Lord? Like your neighbor that is a total heathen that, that doesn't know the Lord at all. Do you ever walk out and go, hey, good morning, praise the Lord, and they go, hey, man, worship Jesus today, right? This is the point. This is the point. Only the redeemed understand how important it is to praise the Lord. And if God is going to be praised, it's because his redeemed are choosing to praise him. And I know this is a soapbox of mine. Some of you are probably tired of hearing about it, but you know, I served as a worship leader for the longest time. Um, some, at, for many years, I was a worship leader and a pastor, and, you know, but worship has always been part of my DNA. I have always loved worshiping the Lord, and I have never understood this thing that we see in church sometimes where you know, we're, we're having this time of worship, we're drawing attention to what Jesus has done, and you've got people going like this. Seven. Or the guy that was in our back row on a Sunday morning with his newspaper open. <laughs> it's like, I'm glad I didn't see him. I would have given him a personalized message, you know, but here's, here's the thing. If you have been redeemed by the Lord, you have been redeemed to worship him, to praise him. And that's why the psalmist now, he tells us who is supposed to praise the Lord. It's the redeemed, the servants of the Lord. And now we're going to get into why God is praised. This is cool. Notice the next line in the psalm, praise the name of the Lord. Now, if you're just reading through the Psalms, sometimes you just miss this stuff. Yeah, praise the name of the Lord. And sometimes, you know, you'll hear that in a song. The name of the Lord shall be praised, and this and that and the other. But I want to take a minute, and I want to talk to you about names. Because in the Bible, and in the culture that we're reading about, names are very, very important. Names always had a meaning. And in this culture, kids were named 
in the hopes or with the faith that they were going to live up to what their name means. And so when we start talking about names, names are really important. I did, I did a little bit of research today. Um, I wanted to see if I have lived up to my name. And it was scary because I know what my last name means, but I, I had forgotten what my first name means. You know, my name is Randy and it's actually short for Randolph. And if anybody makes fun of me, we, we will have word. No, Randolph. Do you know what Randolph means? This is really interesting. House wolf. House wolf. How many of you keep a wolf in your house? No. We have coyote problems in our neighborhood right now. You do. Kelly keeps a wolf in her house. <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. It boils down to this. It means protector. And, and my last name, Lucero, means carrier of light. Okay? So my first name, protector, I'm a shepherd of a flock. What do shepherds carry? A stick. What do they run off? Run off in it kind of wolf. interesting. I have to run off wolves when my name means wolf, but I'm the house wolf, running off the big bad wolf. You know, that's I don't know, but bearer of light. I just thought it was so cool that that long before my parents even had a clue that I would want to pursue serving Jesus with all of my life, because nobody in my family, I don't have any relatives who have ever been anything close to you know a, a pastor or anything like that. But I was named Randolph Lucero, the protector and bearer of light. And I just think that's the coolest thing. I'm so happy to find out that I'm actually living in what my, my name means. And only God could do that. But here the psalmist, he praises God because of what his names reveal about him. And so I made a, a partial list of the names of God and, and each of their meanings. And I'm hoping that by just going over these quickly tonight, it's going to help us to be able to praise the name of the Lord because we understand more about what his name means. And again, this we could go on for weeks doing this, but we're just going to start with, I think I put 10 of them up here. We're going to begin with Yahweh or Jehovah. And this is actually the proper name of God. So in the same way that, you know, my name is Randy and this is Harry and you know, we have Keith. Those are proper names. When God identified himself, he said, my name is Yahweh. My name is Jehovah, when we you know, bring it into English. And it basically means that he is the self-existent one. I am that I am. This is what he said to Moses. And you know what's so cool about that name is that it was so holy that name was so holy and so highly regarded among the Hebrew people that they wouldn't speak it and they wouldn't even write it because they felt like as sinful human beings, they just shouldn't do it. So they took Yahweh and they shortened it to Y-H-W-H. -H. The, the technical term for that is the Tetragrammatron. And, and it just means four letters, um, big name for four letters. But the, the, the Hebrew scribes, were so enamored by the name of God that when they were copying the scriptures and they came to the name of God, they would stop. They would do a ceremonial bathing. They would put on clean clothes. They would get a fresh writing utensil and a fresh inkwell. And then they would write the name of God. And then they would stop and they would go again, change their clothes, go through a ceremonial washing, get a new ink well, and a new writing utensil just to go on writing the rest of the scriptures. And what if God's name appeared a couple of times in the row? Can you imagine the productivity would go way down? They held his name in such high regard. And, and I got to think about this. How often do we as Christians just go, oh God, right? We just throw out, you know, and because when, when we say God to a born again believer, we know who we're talking about, right? And I think that tonight, maybe one of the things that God wants to do is we talk about worshiping him and thinking about being the redeemed and the delivered of the Lord is that we would up our level of reverence towards him. Um, just really think about the name of the Lord. We'll go through a few more. El Shaddai. This is the Lord God Almighty who is all sufficient. So you know what? When you use the term El Shaddai and you read it in the scriptures, what you can read is that God is communicating to us that he is everything that we need. We need absolutely nothing else. We have the term Jehovah Jireh. 
the Lord who provides for us. Are you lacking tonight? He's the provider. El Elyon. This is the God most high. This is kind of that term that's used. My God outranks every other God. There is no one to compete with him, right? We have Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. And sometimes people go, I don't get that. What do you mean the Lord is my banner? He is my refuge. His name is upon me and I can flee to him. He is my refuge. Jehovah Ra'ah. This is the Lord, my shepherd. So every once in a while when you feel a little bit lost and he brings you back, it's because he is your shepherd. And then Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals me. Jehovah Shema, the Lord who makes himself known to me. And you know what? That one's special to me right now because I don't know if you guys ever go through desert experiences. People think that pastors never have rough times and it's, I, I feel like, I spend a lot of time having desert experiences. I go through these deep, amazing times with the Lord, and then I wake up one day and I'm like, what happened? And I sometimes go through what feels like a desert experience, and he is the God who makes himself known to me. He's the God who reminds me of who he is when I feel like I'm out in the desert. Jehovah Tassid Canoe. This is the Lord our righteousness. And boy, if that doesn't apply when we think about Jesus, where does our righteousness come from? being in Christ. And then this is another one. Jehovah Mekodeshikim. This is the Lord who sanctifies you. And all we did is just, we scratched the surface of who God is. But go back with me, if you would, to this third sentence that we looked at here, where it says, praise the name of the Lord. Did that help at all? Doesn't that help to remind ourselves who it is we're praising? This is the character of the God that we worship. And, and when you really get to know who he is, then your worship relationship with him goes so much deeper because you're not just going, oh, praise the name of the Lord. You're going, praise the one who is my provider. He is my healer. He is the one whom I run to. He's the one who reveals himself to me. He's my shepherd. He's the most high God. That, that's really cool. And, and now I want you to see in verse 2, we're told where praise should fit into the life of the redeemed. Notice, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. Now, I'm just going to kind of say something here, and it's, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, tongue-in-cheek truth, okay? There's a lot of people, I mean, born-again believers who love the Lord and they're committed to Him, and if you talk to them about, listen, when should worship take place? They go, well, from 10 to 10.30 on Sunday morning. And then the band quits and Pastor Andy gets up, and then, then worship goes from like however long Pastor Andy teaches until we leave, um, another 10 minutes or something like that. And then Wednesday, it's from 7 to about 7.25, that's when worship takes place. And we begin to think of worship as singing songs, but... But really, worship is just the abandoning of our life to him. The, as Paul said in, in Romans 12, the offering of our bodies on, on the altar as living sacrifices. And so if you look back at verse 2, the name of the Lord should be praised and blessed. Notice, from this time forth and forevermore. If you know the book of Revelation, you know that as soon as we are raptured off the face of the earth, we enter into the throne room where those who have gone before us are gathered around and they're worshiping the Father for creation and they're worshiping Jesus for redemption. So worshipers who worship all the time and then, you know, all of a sudden they instantly die in a car wreck or something. They just didn't know it was coming. All of a sudden they're, they're with the Lord and they're like, well, the song is the same, but the environment looks a little bit different. See, the whole idea is we should just be worshiping always because worship is going on in heaven. It should go on on earth all the time in the life of a believer. And, and then the psalm ends. It's a short psalm. It, it ends with a list of reasons why God deserves to be praised. Look at verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. And, and so even though it was Passover and this was focused on the nation of Israel, the psalmist wants the people to remember that he's not just the God of Israel. He's not just the God of the world. He's the God of the entire universe. He is the God high above everything. Verse 5, who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? And then look at verse 6, who humbles himself to behold the things 
that are in the heavens and in the earth. He just said that he's the God of the universe. He dwells on high. He dwells in heaven. And yet, notice he concerns himself with the affairs of men on earth. And his biggest concern is illustrated in the fact that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. For the Hebrews celebrating Passover, they didn't say, man, he sent Jesus. They said, well, he sacrificed the Passover lamb to set us free. But we know that later Jesus came and he became the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what's cool about this, and I forgot to tell you this at the beginning, we know from Mark chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 26 that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, what did he do with his disciples? He had a Passover meal, right? And we know that both Mark and Matthew record that they sang the hymns. So these six hymns that, that were psalms that we're studying this week and next week, Jesus sang with his disciples before he left the upper room to go and to pray in the garden and, you know, and be uh, betrayed and all of that stuff. I mean, that blows my mind. Verse 7, he, he raises the poor out of the dust and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. And so applying to Israel at the Passover, the nation of Israel were sitting in the dust of Egypt. They were in, as he wrote here, the ash heap. Their, their life was like an ash heap because they were captives. And notice that God raised them up out of that. And he led her to this new home in the promised land where she was highly exalted. She was God's special nation among all other nations. But this is really prophetic of Jesus. Think, of, think about this. Think about what's written here. Our sin made us poor and needy, didn't it? Our sin had us in the dust, in the ash heaps, so to speak. And God and his compassion, he humbled himself and he came down to earth as a man and he died on a cross to save us. He raised us up out of our sin. And then think about this. He seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, high above all power and rule and authority and every name that would exalt itself above the name of the Lord. And so when you ponder that, and you think about how this is so prophetic of what Jesus did for us, notice the last line of the psalm. It just says, what does it say? Say it out loud. Praise the Lord. It begins with hallelujah, and it ends with hallelujah. And so we get to chapter 14, and now we've left Egypt, and we've started our journey to the promised land. And I want to look here at Psalm 14. We're going to call this the journey to the promised land. And remember, Jesus sang this with his disciples before he went to that garden to pray. And so the psalmist writes, when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became a sanctuary and Israel became his dominion. So when, when Israel was in Egypt, they were strangers in a foreign land and they were captives and surrounded by hostile oppressors. And then, remember the story, lambs were sacrificed. Their blood was placed on the doors. The people were delivered out of their captivity to Egypt and two huge major changes took place for them. They went from being slaves and captives to being two different things. Notice what it is here. First of all, they became God's sanctuary. The people of God, the nation of Israel, notice here in verse 1 and 2, became God's sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? It's his dwelling place on earth among men. And then the second thing we see here is that they also became the place of God's dominion. The place where God would rule over his people. And, and they counted it as a privilege. Okay, God lives among us and God rules over us. It was a privilege to them. Notice verse 3. Now, this is Hebrew poetry. So you gotta, you got to realize that this isn't literal. This is poetry. It says, the sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams. The little hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back. O mountains, that you skipped like rams. O little hills, like lambs. Again, Hebrew poetry. 
And, and what the psalmist is saying is that after Israel left Egypt, their journey began when they crossed over the Red Sea. And then they went to Mount Sinai where God sent fire and earthquakes and smoke and lightning and all this stuff and then he gave Moses the law and then they start wandering towards the promised land and we know how they rebelled against God and so 40 years later their journey finally ended when they crossed the Jordan and they went into the promised land. So you see it there. You got the sea. That's the Red Sea. The Jordan that turned back. That's the Jordan River 40 years later. The mountain that skipped like a ram and the little hills like lambs. That, that's Mount Sinai. And so we're on a journey here. We left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. We went to Mount Sinai, got the law. And 40 years later, we enter into the promised land. And now verse 7, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. And so along the way in the wilderness, the psalmist now kind of takes a step back in the story. And he says, and don't forget that these people were rebels and that God, although Moses was ready to, you know, trade them in for newer models or whatever it was, you know, God just, how about you kill them all and just give me some new people, you know? Remember that? The psalmist is saying God was so full of grace and mercy and compassion towards those people that although they rebelled and they wanted to go back to Egypt and they complained, there they are in a desert that had no provision and God gives them water from a rock. And he goes on to tell us what kind of a rock, a flint rock. So, uh, you know, the Flintstones are in the Bible. He didn't know that. They are. I mean, isn't, isn't this so prophetic? Because we're going to turn it now into how this applies to us, right? Before you and I were saved, we weren't captives to Pharaoh and Egypt. We were captives to Satan and to the world. And so when we cried out to the Lord, something amazing happened. A lamb was slain and his blood was shed and we were delivered. Look at the screen, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says here that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Powerful verse. And it's, it's the, the prophetic fulfillment of everything that we just read about with Israel in our lives. And, but there's more. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 3.16 up here. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt that they became God's sanctuary and his dominion? Look at what happened to us when we came out of bondage to Satan and to the world. Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Can we stop there for a minute? This blows my mind. Do you, by name, not know that you are the temple of God? I mean, when you were born again by putting your faith in Jesus, God the Holy Spirit took up residence in you and you're no longer this empty shell of a person. God lives inside of you. I mean, that blows my mind. This is, this is, okay, this is crazy. God is in me and God is in you to save you and to lead you to the promised land of sanctification. I mean, I can't comprehend that, guys. Amen. <laughs> Think, I, I just want you to hear this again. God is in you and in me. Paul says that, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Why? Because Jesus said that the kingdom of God isn't visible, it's in the hearts of men. And so God allowed you and I to become his sanctuary, that he might have dominion in our individual lives so that corporately the kingdom of God is alive and bearing fruit on the face of the earth. I mean, when people say we don't study the Old Testament, it's boring, it doesn't apply, I gotta tell you, I love teaching the Old Testament because we find Jesus on every single page. And so we'll end this psalm by just kind of summarizing this. Israel was saved, and then they went across the Red Sea, 
and then they went across the Jordan, you and I, we were saved. We went through the waters of baptism, then through the wilderness of life. Anybody in a wilderness? And then we go across the Jordan, so to speak, which is, it's not entering into heaven. It's just entering into that sanctified life of Christian maturity. I mean, it's just so beautiful to look at this. And you know what's so cool? I want to remind you again. Jesus saying this with his disciples just before he headed to the cross. And they're all probably doing this. We've been singing this song since we were little boys and they've got it all memorized. And as Jesus sings it with them, I bet they're going, this is starting to take on some meaning that I never, ever thought of. And then imagine the first Passover after his resurrection where they're looking at each other singing these songs going, I never saw this before. We're singing about him about what he's done for us. And we'll end the night with Psalm 115. Uh, I'm going to call this a warning for the redeemed. Do you see your salvation in the first two Psalms that we looked at tonight? Do you see that picture of your salvation through leaving Egypt, going through the Red Sea, and going through the Jordan? I mean, it's just such a clear picture of our baptism. Now the psalmist adds a warning because there's a tendency, once people get saved, to do something wrong. And, and it, I'm not talking about like going out and getting involved in some wicked sin or something, but, but just notice what we're going to find. Verse 1, this is a warning for the redeemed. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Now, Psalm 113 and 114 told the story of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and, and their miraculous time going through the wilderness and eventually ending up in the promised land, you know, where they took the, the land of Canaan and, and made it God's land. Now, as we get to Psalm 115, we're remembering that, that in God's mercy and that he heard the cries of the Israelites in Egypt, in Egypt and then his truth... And that's that he had said he was going to deliver them. So he fulfills his mercy and his truth. He, he delivered them from Egypt. He dwelt among them. He did miraculous things. All of these really amazing things. And then he carried them into the promised land. And, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but whenever God does something amazing and miraculous and then people come to talk about it, they oftentimes forget that God does these amazing and miraculous things to bring glory to his name, not simply just for our good. And then what they do is, I mean, just, just picture someone walking up to an Israelite that enters into the promised land and goes, you know, just one generation ago, your people were slaves in Egypt. And now look, you guys have taken the entire land of, of Canaan. You guys are special. Good for you. Good job, right? I don't know if you've ever experienced that. We had a relative here in, in Greer about a year and a half ago. And... Um, this relative watched us pack a U-Haul, leave Albuquerque, and head to a place none of us had ever heard of to plant a church. And, you know, here uh, 11 or 12 years later, they come and they walk into this facility and participate in a Sunday morning service. And as we're leaving the church later, this relative looks and says, you guys have done an amazing thing here. And, of course, this person doesn't know the Lord. And the Lord has done an amazing thing here, amen? Amen. But, but let's be honest, for the last 11 years that, you know, before this person had seen it, Kelly and I were spearheading it. We were part of it. We were doing it. And so from the outside, someone looks in and goes, wow, you guys have done a lot. We look and we say, I can't even believe what God has done. This is what God has done. And we just got to come along for the ride. And the psalmist is saying, not unto us, Lord but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. He's telling us, be careful, believer, because there's going to come a time where some amazing thing happens in your life and someone's going to come along and say, what an amazing thing you've done. And you know what's going to happen to that little human pride thing that lives inside of you? You're going to go, well, me and Jesus have done quite a bit, right? And what the psalmist is saying is that we have to be so careful that God gets the glory for everything, that we aren't even mentioned except for the fact that God was good, right? And then notice 
how he explains to be careful. He, he, he talks about idolatry. He says, why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? Now this requires a little bit of just backstory. In Egypt, in the wilderness, and in Canaan, God's people were surrounded by people who worshipped idols. And so if they had a deity, that deity may live near an altar or in a temple, but it was always represented by some kind of an idol, some structure, a statue, or something like that. And what happened is that they began to see God doing all these wild, crazy, amazing things, and they come to see it for themselves, and they see that there's a tabernacle, but there's no icon. There's no statue. There's no idol. And, and the Gentiles would say to the Jewish people, we don't think that you guys actually have a God. Because if you had a God, he would be on top of a little platform here, and you would be able to bring him offerings and show him to your friends. And every time we come to meet your God, we don't see anybody. And they're basically saying, we don't think you guys really have a God. And so the Israelites' answer comes in verse 3. But our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Now, it's important that we tune into that he does whatever he pleases part. Because the gods that all of the Egyptians and the people in the desert and the people in Canaan worshipped, None of these gods claimed to be the god of the entire universe. They were territorial gods. They were the god of the mountains, or they were the god of the plains. They were the god of the rivers, or the god of the lakes, or something like that. But they were, you know, territorial. They were geographical. And what they did had to do with where they lived. And so it might very well possibly be that your god of fire would be knocked out by your friend's god of water, right? Right? The Israelites come along and they say, well, let me tell you about our God. The reason you don't see him here on earth in the form of a statue is because he lives in heaven. Because he created everything that we see. And because he created everything, guess what that means? It belongs to him. And that means that he can do with it whatever he wants. He is the God above all other gods. Right? And, and as they communicate this, now the psalmist says this. He says, he, he says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And I mean, none of us, does anybody in here bow down to something that you made? So we don't struggle with this. This is not part of our culture. We don't even run into it anywhere. So it just blows our mind to think, you mean they would cut down a tree and they would get out their carving tools and they would make it look like something and they would cover it with metal and then they would worship it? They would really do that and say it's a god? Yep. And the psalmist comes along and goes, I'm going to tell you why that's so crazy. It's the work of men's hands. You're worshiping something you created. We worship the one that created everything, including the wood and the gold that you use to make your little statue that you worship, right? And then it's cool because they go on and, and, I don't know, I think they're picking fun, but they're making a point. Talking about these, these idols, they say seven, or, yeah, seven things that these idols have and can't do. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Now this is interesting because the Bible teaches, I know so many people claim to be atheists and, and atheists have YouTube channels and they're proving to the world that there's no God and this and that and the other. The Bible is so clear that there's no such thing as an atheist. In other words, everybody worships something. And the psalmist is proving that to be true. He, he's basically saying that whatever a person's master passion is in life, that's their God. Wherever they invest their time and their treasure and their resources, that is their God. They're actually worshiping something, even if it's themselves. So there's no such thing as a true atheist, biblically speaking. But the psalmist says, and I want you to notice seven things about these idols that these people worship. They can't speak, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't smell, they can't handle anything, they can't walk, they can't even mumble. But then he turns around, and please don't miss this. He tells us what an idol can do. 
An idol can't do any of these other things, but it can do one thing. And this is where you and I have to be so careful because we have idols, even though they may not be like these idols. Notice verse 8, those who make them are like them. And so is everyone who trusts in them. And so he reminds us that these idols can't do these seven things, but they can do one thing. They can make you just like them. And anything that you make an idol in your life, it's going to be deaf, it's going to be dumb, it's going to be blind, it's going to be lame, and it's going to make you spiritually deaf, spiritually dumb, spiritually blind, spiritually lame. Because you've elevated it above the Lord. And you can say, well, give us an example real quick. What kind of idols do we make today? Jobs, careers, other people, pursuits, money, hobbies, all these things. Anything can be made a God. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what is your master passion? What is it that really gets you out of bed on your day off? You know, what's that one thing that you're just so passionate about? What, what are you willing to invest your free time and your, your discretionary finances in? If it's Jesus, that's awesome. But if it's anything less than Jesus, it is going to mold you into its image eventually. And you have to be very, very careful. So with that in mind, look at verses 9 through 11. This is where the warning and the, the exhortation comes in. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron. So this would be the priesthood. Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And then just the average person who walks with the Lord, he says, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And, and what he's saying is this, and he's saying it to you and I tonight. He's saying, guard your heart against allowing any kind of idol to rise up in your life. And then notice he gives a promise to the people who heed this promise and we examine our life and we say, okay, I do have an idol and I'm going to put it back in its proper place. Notice verse 12. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth, the heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. And then he ends this psalm after saying that, that keeping God at the forefront is going to result in, in every kind of blessing you can possibly fathom. He says this, verse 17 and 18, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore Praise the Lord. Now, scholars don't all agree on this interpretation. There's a couple of different interpretations, but I've studied this pretty in, in depth, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I believe in context verse 17 and 18 mean. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. If you keep this in the context of the psalm, he's talking about those who worship idols. While they're alive, they're, they're the dead. They're not spiritually alive, and they don't worship the Lord. And then when they go down into the grave, they don't go to a place where there's constant worship. They go into silence. But we, notice this, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. It's what we looked at before. We're, we don't worship idols. We worship the Lord, and we worship him 24-7. And when this life is over, we're going to go into eternity, and according to Revelation 4 and 5, we're going to have this period of time where we just worship the Lord until he brings us back to the earth to establish his kingdom. And, and that's, to me, just really powerful. So let's just draw this to a close, and we'll pick it up again next week to finish these Egyptian Hillel Psalms. But Psalm 113, here's my exhortation to you. I encourage you to study the names of God. And watch how that is going to change the way that you worship and the way that you think about God. Psalm 114, remember that you are the temple of the Lord. Let that just blow your mind. When you're going to work tomorrow, it's like, you know, when people say, hey, take Jesus to work with you, you don't have a choice. He lives in you. He's going everywhere you go. So I think when you get out of, work, out of the car at work tomorrow, just say, hey, Lord, how about
about you be on the forefront and I'll just be in the background today? And then Psalm 115, so important for you and I today. Guard yourself against the trap of idolatry. This world is filled with things that promise to bless you, but in the end, they really do destroy you. I read a statistic, and this is, this is just not to say, go get rid of these things. The average American in 2018 spent three hours and 58 minutes on their cell phone every single day on their smartphone. They devoted three hours and 40, 58 minutes to their, self, to their smartphone every single day in 2018, the average American. How many of those people spent three hours and 58 minutes in the Word, in worship, in fellowship? Okay. In 2017, the average American spent two hours and 57 minutes in front of the TV every single day in the year 2017. Now, the good news, TV use is going down. The bad news, smartphone use is increasing. We don't need our TV anymore. We've got everything we need right here on our smartphone. And, and I'm not saying go chuck your smartphone. I'm just saying that we are all so prone to taking the most precious commodity that we have, which is time, and using it in a way that could be considered idolatry. And so I'm just saying look at every area of your life and carefully move forward. Father, I, in no way am trying to be legalistic about television or smartphones or any of that stuff, Lord. I just merely have this stirring in my soul right now, Lord, that you want me to use my time in a more worshipful way. That I personally need to guard myself against any kind of idolatry, Lord, that could open a door for me to fall into compromise. And I want to pray that for everybody in this room. Lord, as we studied these three psalms tonight, we remember Jesus saying these very things on the night that he was betrayed. He sang about what his future events the next day were going to do for us as they fulfilled prophecy. I want to pray as we sing this closing song, Lord, that we could just be mindful that we are redeemed, that we are the temple of the Lord, and Lord, that you want to have dominion in each and every one of our lives, that the kingdom of God would move forward powerfully. And so, Lord, tonight, however you want to speak to us, give us each a little nugget to take with us, Lord, in the core of our being as we sing this final song. Just speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's worship.
again tonight. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. your name. God, you are our banner. You're our healer, our protector, our strong tower. God, you're our provider. You are our righteousness as well. God, we want to lift up your name into this, this city. God, we just want to shine your light, God. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.